Hello, everybody. Welcome to part 7C of the reading of the Magdalene Manuscript. Now, once again, if you are new to this channel, welcome. I'm so happy you're here, but you probably want to start with part one. Now, again, that might not be necessary, though, because the first part of this manuscript is a channeled message from Mary Magdalene or the entity known as Mary Magdalene. And in the back part of this manuscript, where we are now, is the writer himself, the channeler himself, speaking about different types of spiritual practices that involve invoking the subtle body, the spiritual body, the energetic body that was presently spoken about in the channelings from Magdalene herself. Now, I'm actually enjoying his part of this book more than the channeling on Magdalene. As most of you know, I'm very, very, very close to Mary Magdalene. She has been one of my guides, at least since I was 16 years old. I am um, Claire Audio. I do hear her speaking. I do see things sometimes too, but I mostly am audio. I hear her a lot. And I know a lot of you have said in these videos that you actually see her standing behind me, which she is mostly behind me a lot. And with the channelings, as you guys know, there's a lot in the channelings from him with her that I absolutely agree with, but there's a lot about it that I don't agree with. And I think, again, channeling, you always have to take any form of channeling with a grain of salt. And that is because as human beings, as the conduits to this channeling, we are filtering the information through our own awareness. And we know that there is no such thing as actual reality. Reality is merely your perception of the world around you. So my reality is different from your reality, depending on the world around us. And we have been grandfathered into certain beliefs. One being that the entity known as Yahshua ben Joseph, or as they want you to call him Jesus, was crucified. And I firmly believe, and as Magdalene herself has told me, that never happened. He was never, the real Christ was never, never crucified. Uh, Mithra was crucified and the uh, Christian faith, the invention of the Christian faith at the Council of Nicaea is basically a knockoff version of Mithraism, not the actual teachings of the Christ. And as you guys know, both Magdalene and Yahshua were the Christ. You have to have two. You have to have the divine feminine and the divine masculine. But again, with that being said, I'm really enjoying his writings on alchemy and all these different systems of spirituality, because this is something I feel like that is way more practical for us as a whole. As you guys know, channeling is not spirituality. Channeling is just being able to communicate with the other side, which in all honesty, as he spoke about last week in our discussion on Sidhis, we are all born with that ability. We're all born with these lesser Sidhis of Claire audience, clairvoyance, uh, all the Claire's, right? We're all born with that. It just depends on if it's activated or not. And in my opinion, I think when we're born, all of these Claire's are fully activated and then the world starts to shut them down. So having a gift of hearing or prophecy isn't really necessarily a gift. It just means it's already been activated in you and we all have those abilities. True spirituality, on the other hand, true spirituality is working on yourself, is actually getting down to the human part of you, working through your shadow self, working through your ego. If you know somebody who claims to be in the spiritual world but has a huge ego, they're not in the spiritual world. The ego is the false sense of reality. And so a lot of this work does not involve channeling, but, but literally working on yourself, on all of your darkness, breaking through, crying tears, having the ego death. And a lot of these practices that he's giving you can help with that a lot. So again, they call in the Egyptian alchemy, they call the spiritual body, the subtle body, the, the soul essence of the body as the ka. And as we talked about last week, when we closed off part 7B. Uh, he talked about seeing a patient of his that had previously passed away. Somebody saw that patient in his office, which we would call that a ghost. But what that is, is actually the spiritual body. It's the ka body that's left behind. Many of us have had experiences, I'm sure, with seeing loved ones who have passed away, seeing them come to us, talk to us tell us everything is okay. And when they come to us, they are in their Ka body, their energetic body. When you guys see Magdalene, she's in her Ka body. 
right? Because she's not in the physical form yet. I do believe that she will be coming back through again, back to humanity once we flip. But for now, she's still in her Ka body. All right, so we're going to start this week on, for me, it's page 119. It's a section entitled Effects of Strengthening the Ka. Now, I will place um, down in the description box, I'm going to put part 7A and 7B from this series, which you can just listen to that if you're not interested in the channeled work. But I will also put the playlist Understanding the Magdalene, where all of these are located, all the parts are located in that playlist. I will also put that down in the description box too, in case you guys are interested in going back and going through everything. All right, effects of strengthening the Ka. As the Ka body becomes stronger, Due to energy building practices, the power of the mind will also become stronger. Thus, the practitioner can draw to himself or herself objects of desire much more quickly. The ability to accomplish this feat of magnetizing desire occurs as an interface between the actual strength of the Ka and one's degree of spiritual understanding regarding the possibilities. If one possesses a strong Ka without a spiritual understanding of its significance, then the Ka cannot be fully utilized. Conversely, if someone has a higher degree of understanding but has not taken up the task of strengthening the Ka, then likewise the Ka cannot be fully utilized. In this case, however, the deficit is due to a lack of energy, not a lack of understanding. One of the side effects of strengthening the Ka is an increased potency for spiritual illumination. In such instances, the luminous body of the Ka literally radiates more light. This inner light is usually not visible except in the rarest of instances, but those who are psychic can see this type of light more <laughs> quite clearly. It kind of makes me laugh because the Bible talks about the light body, and a lot of people are saying that those of us on camera are starting to have more of a light coming coming out of us on camera, which I've said this before to you guys, and you guys always talk about their orbs around me, and I I, I can see them um, because I'm my camera actually gives me playback while I'm filming, so I can see the orbs when I'm filming. And I want to like I want to reassure you guys that the same thing is most likely happening to you too. The only difference is is that me and some other people who you're also noticing this happen to are on camera, so there's evidence of it. If you're not on camera, you probably don't see all the orbs around you, and you probably don't know that you too are also sending out a light through your body. It's like your, your coloring is shifting. So I want to reassure you that the same thing is probably happening to you that you're seeing in all of us on YouTube as well, if that makes sense. There is also an interesting belief game from building the car. Once the Ka has autonomy, it can do all kinds of things like travel in other dimensions of consciousness or gain insight and knowledge. This activity can be quite rewarding to the alchemist. I remember my own first encounters with a master alchemist in other realms. He continues to this day to be a great source of insight and encouragement. The Jed. As the Ka builds in strength, there is an alchemical task that the alchemist can undertake. However, this cannot be accomplished until there is enough energy in the Ka, since this act takes tremendous energy and intent. The task to which I am referring to involves the Jed. The Jed is the central pathway up the chakra, up the spine. So in, in the East, in yoga, we call that Shishumna, right? That pathway along the spine. I've spoken about this a lot. So... Shishumna is a nadi, and you have roughly 75,000 nadis in your body. These are like little creeks and uh, vayus, pathways of energy that run all through you. And there's only three that we really focus on. Uh, the first two come through the nostrils. And as he's spoken about in previous episodes, they come through the nostrils and they intertwine around the body. And then the third one, which is the utmost importance one, is the one that goes up the spine. That's Shishumna, or as he's calling it here, the Jed. All right. So let's start that sentence again. The Jed is a central pathway of the chakras up the spine. As energy is progressively moved upward, there is an accompanying expansion of awareness. This movement of energy up the Jed is sometimes referred to as the raising of the Jed. And the power that drives this energy up the Jed is nothing less than Shakem or life force. This term literally means that which makes things erect. There's a lot of jokes I could go with on that, but anyway. 
To better understand the profound effects of raising the jet, it might be helpful to take a look at how the chakra filter perceptions since they are radically affected by this action. So yes, and I know Stephanie's been talking about this a lot. I've been trying to bring this up to people. What I've noticed in my observation in this great awakening, because we know that this war is not about politics, it's not about medicine, it's not about education, it's about spirituality. Okay, and so a lot of people, especially in the Western world, are being dumped. There's a lot of information that's being dumped in your lap without a teacher, without somebody to help you. You're trying to dig through all of this by yourself. And so a lot of people are so focused on their upper chakras, especially their sixth chakra and their seventh chakra, that they forget all about the ones beneath it. And as I just said, true spirituality is not channeling. It's not talking to the dead. It's not reading tarot cards. True spirituality is descending into yourself and fixing yourself. If you are so focused on this and this without paying any attention to anything beneath it, you're going to go into delusion. You're going to start having delusions of grandeur. I am seeing this so much now on social media. In fact, there's a person who's my friend on Facebook that is constantly posting pictures of us truthers saying that we're celebrities, that, that we're someone that we're not. I have been told it pisses me off. Nothing makes me more mad than when somebody tries to put an identity on me that's not me. I've had many people say I'm Princess Diana. I've had people say I'm a Kennedy and that Kaylee McEnany and I are sisters. We're not sisters. The only thing that gives into that delusion is that we both have blonde hair and blue eyes, but we look nothing alike. And I, I am the granddaughter of Ed Watson. I'm not a Kennedy. I'm a Watson by birth. My parents are my parents. Okay. But a lot of this feeding into this delusion of grandeur is because people aren't working on themselves. They're not working on themselves. They're engaging in a form of escapism. Oh, let's make all these truthers famous people. Ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a form of escapism. No, 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 no. You need to work on yourself. First of all, you don't need to be sitting around eating popcorn, waiting for the Kennedys to do something. If that's what you're doing, we're not going to ascend. We are the storm. How are we the storm? Because we're starting to work on ourselves, ourselves. It was Constantine the Great. I know this is going to piss a lot of Christians off when I say this, and I'm just, I want you to understand I'm the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. Do your own research. Do your own research. The information is out there. It's very easy to find. Before the Council of Nicaea, whenever that took place, right now we're not so sure about dates. They tell us it was 325 AD. Not so certain anymore. Anyway, it, at that council, Constantine made, well, first of all, turned Yahshua's teachings into that of Mithra. That's a whole other story, which we've spoken about a lot. But he also made the person known as Yahshua a god. Yahshua in the true teachings of Christ never said he was a god. They called him rabbi or teacher. And he was actually in the priest and priestesshood of Isis and Osiris. Most some of his students were, were uh, of Jewish descent, but he was Egyptian. He called himself teacher. He and Magdalene's job was to teach people. That's why the original Christians were Gnostics. They worked on their inner knowing that they themselves controlled their relationship with God and that no other human being, whether it be a preacher, a pastor, Yahshua himself, Magdalene, no other human being stood in between you and your creator. You had the divine spark already within you. Okay. And so this idea of relying on somebody else to do it for you, whether that's the Kennedys, the Trump family, whether that's um, Yahshua, Allowing somebody else to do your work for you means you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay stuck. And that's what the original word of sin meant. It meant to miss the mark, to not understand who you really are. You are not some sinful, horrible being that's just lucky to be here. You are holy and wonderfully made by source creator. 
And so I really, really, really hope that everybody listening right now takes this all in. You're never going to be finished with your work. It's as long as you're breathing, as long as you've incarnated into a body, you're still going to have work to do, right? But the more you dig deep into who you are and what you need to work on, your whole perception of everything is going to start to shift and change. You're going to get calmer. You're going to be more at peace. Your vibrational frequency is going to rise because everything we hold on to, all of this shadow work, energy is not created nor destroyed. It just is. It always is and will be. The only thing energy can we can do with that energy is transmute it. This is why my friend Shanti talks a lot about alchemy, the alchemy of turning lead, a heavy, heavy energy like lead and changing it into gold, the shiny bright light of gold. When you are holding on to your shadow work, that gross stuff, those emotions that we all have that we don't want to deal with, when you're holding on to that, that energy isn't going to go anywhere. No one's going to be able to take that energy off of you or away from you. That's not how it works. That's your karma. That's your work to work through. That's your lead to turn to gold. And so we have to dive deep, deep, all the way down to Muladhara, the first chakra, to start to untangle all these webs of deception and shadow work that we've been carrying inside of us. And when we start to look at it, when we start to get uncomfortable, we start to settle into that, and we start to cry, and we start to release, and we start to understand how this heavy energy that we've been carrying has changed us has dimmed our light, only then can our light start to shine again. Only then can that energy start to move up. All right. But being so focused on this sixth chakra and seventh chakra and this psychic stuff and this, it's, and you haven't worked on that. You're still holding on to that energy, that baggage. It's just going to bring you to a point of crazy making. As my teacher calls it in India, crazy making delusions. Okay, so we have to be and, and, and the controllers know that the controllers know this. Why do you think 90% of the truth or community is infiltrators working for the controllers? 90% of the people you watch as truthers are being paid by the controllers because they're trying to keep you in a sense of delusion so that you don't do the work so that we don't ascend. Okay, and so I really am glad he's bringing up the chakra system because I want... The best thing to do to start to work on shadow work is to start exercising, get an exercise program. You don't have to go run a marathon, you know, do 30 minutes of a bar class, do something and, and doing something like chasing after your kids or playing with your kids in the pool or gardening. That's not, that doesn't count because your attention is on something else. You need to do something that's going to pull your attention inside of yourself. You need to do something that's going to make you experience how uncomfortable exercising can, can be and continue to move forward through it. Continue to allow all that to come up. Nothing to distract you, but just to bring you into yourself. True spirituality is ugly. True spirituality is not light and love. Light and love comes at the very end. When you start true spirituality, there's a lot of darkness that you have to work through. And you can't avoid it. You can't go through around the forest to get to the other side you have to go through it okay and it, it's very empowering I, I know stephanie and i've done some videos on this i kind of want to do another video again soon about exercise and what the true uh power of exercise can be beyond what we've been taught in the western world but i just really i'm sorry to go on a tangent about that but i just really want everybody to not fall into another trap set up by the controllers okay Understand, please hear this, hear this, channeling, tarot card reading, reading the I Ching, doing the pendulum, that's all great and fun and we get information and we can learn from that. I you guys know I love my tarot cards, but it's not spirituality. It's not. It's not. And if you think it is, that's escapism. That's you avoiding the work. That person out there running is doing more spiritual work in that moment than someone pulling tarot cards. And that's just the, the harsh reality. In fact, I don't even think my teacher in India would want me playing with channeling because he would be afraid it would be a distraction. 
I'm also going to put a link to a book called Eastern Body, Western Mind down in the description box below. I read it a long time ago. It's a great book that breaks down all the different chakra systems, uh, their symbols, their colors, what they are in Sanskrit, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's a great starting place for people who are new to the chakra system uh, for you guys to order. And you can, it's a great book because you don't have to, you can like pick it up and put it back, pick it up and put it back because each uh, chapter is a different chakra, right? All right, let's continue. The chakras. In terms of spiritual evolution and the relativity of perception, the chakras are very significant. Let's say that there are seven people at a picnic. It's a balmy day and the park is full. Each of these seven people will have a very different experience of the world based upon the activity of his or her chakras. Yep. This is a hypothetical example since rarely are the ch chakras activated in a sequence. Most of us have a mixture of open and closed, but for illustrative purposes, our seven imaginary people will help us bring better understanding to the filtering of perception that occurs through the chakra system. All right. I just want to say something too, because I don't like the word closed. And there are some healers out there on uh, healers out there on YouTube that are talking about closing down your chakras. I had one infiltrator on David Zublik's channel that I knew right away was an infiltrator because everything she was saying was just absolutely not true um, whatsoever. If, if a healer tells you to close down your chakras, do not go to that healer. They're practicing black magic. Okay. You cannot close your chakras down. They can be overactive or underactive, but they can't be closed down. With that being said, though, um, as you were born, which the book Eastern Body, Western Mind will get into, you develop your chakras through different stages. The last one to develop is the seventh one. That's why teenagers are such assholes sometimes because they have the mental capacity, brain function of an adult, but they haven't developed that seventh chakra of wisdom yet. So that explains a lot with those of you who are dealing with teenagers, but, um, but yeah, they develop as we grow, just like our organs develop, just like our skin develops, the chakras will develop as we grow as well. Okay. And we do have about 140 chakras in the body, but we only focus on the seven that run up the spine. All right. So let's, let's go on. Let's say the first person is living primarily through the first chakra, which is located in an area near the base of the spine. This individual will be most concerned with security and survival. Yep. Forget that it is a beautiful day. The per this person will be anxious. All those people roaming around are possible threats, and this person would be very guarded around strangers. Our second imaginary person lives mostly in the second chakra, located about two inches or four centimeters above the base of the spine. This person is driven to constantly search for new sexual experiences. If he or she is not actively engaged in trying to find someone to have sex with, he or she will be besieged by constant sexual fantasies. This person may even find it difficult to have a conversation with anyone else in the group because he or she cannot help cruise in the crowd. Um, the second chakra is also your creativity as well. It's not just sex. It's also your, your, creative, your creative powers too. The third person in our group is stuck in the solar plexus, which is located behind the pit of the stomach. His or her only real concerns are status and power. If this person engages someone in a conversation, it will only be for what that person might offer, like those corporate power lunches and cocktail parties. Moving our attention to the fourth person, we note that he or she is in the heart chakra, located in the sternum in the center of the chest. For this individual, the world will be full of love. This love is not romantic, but it is more akin to, to what the ancient Greeks called agape or divine love. For this person, the world is love. This love can range from a soft feeling of interconnectedness to an intense experience of universal love. In some cases, such persons spontaneously enter samadhi due to the intensity of their bhakti experience of divine love when the heart opens such such persons often assume that those around them are experiencing the world in the same ways they are this could be quite disconcerting experience when he or she realizes this is not the case and actually the example he's given here is very rare um, most people with anahata which is the fourth chakra um, are usually underactive meaning that they've been hurt a lot, uh, betrayed a lot. It's not just divine love. Yes, the bhakti is a huge part of the fourth chakra. And that's, the, that's part of healing anahata is realizing that this is more of a connection to source, but this also is your connection to other people as well. Okay, so you have that, that tie, especially with twin flames. Twin flames are directly connected by a cord through, the, through anahata. 
Yeah. There, because th this is where the beating of the soul comes from, is that anahata. So there is a literal cord between twins from here to the other person. Even if they haven't met each other yet, that is there. That's literally there. Okay. But a lot of people who've experienced betrayal, um, harshness in relationships, they walk around like this, trying to protect anahata. Yeah. So this is also when you guys know we've spoken about black magic with spell work. This is where a lot of black mag magic pr practitioners lose it is because they can only mess with the mind. They can't mess with the heart. And so they can scramble a person's mind, but yet their heart is still in truth. And so for a while, this might lead, but eventually this wears off and it will always take them back to the heart. Yeah. So, so there's a lot more to say about Anahata than what he's given here. But again, I will place uh, the book Eastern body, Western mind. No, excuse me. Western body, Eastern mind down in the description box below. The fifth person in our little gathering is centered in the throat chakra located in the area above the vocal cords. This person will be highly creative depending upon the strength of his or her will. Creations might come into reality very quickly. It is said that many alchemical traditions that when an individual enters highly advanced evolutionary states, his or her words instantly move into manifestation. Our sixth person is psychic and possesses the gifts of inner senses due to the fact that the third eye is open. The third eye is oddly in the energy point for the chakra is located in the forehead area just above the eye. However, according to some yogic system, this chakra is actually located between the eye and the back behind the bridge of the nose, about an inch or two centimeters. Interestingly, this is the area of the brain where the pituitary gland and the, and the hypothalamus sit. The hypothalamus, uh, the brain's information processing center, allows the brain to communicate with the rest of the body through what is called hypothalamic pathways. The coincidental juxtaposition of this subtle energy center and such a major nerve plexus in the brain is most interesting. And I wonder if he's going to get into the vagus nerve. Um, the vagus nerve is really fascinating. And if that's something, ugh, the comments are going to be disabled on this video, but give this video a like if you want for me to do an episode in the future on the vagus nerve, because that is really fascinating. All right. The person with an open third eye sees the world through the filter of psychic vision. He or she might easily see the auras or energy fields of those around them. He or she might even sense their desires or hear their thoughts. In some cases, he or she might even have prophetic visions and that he or she can sense that probable futures of those around them. Note that I say probable futures. I do not believe the future is predetermined. There are possibilities or choice points and a psychic individual can sometimes sense these but no one can predict one's future with certainty because we all have the power of choice and choice affects our destiny. Exactly. This is what I've been saying. Okay. If somebody is telling you that this whole movement is a movie, they're scamming you. They're not to be trusted. They know that this is not an effing movie. This is a war. This is the biggest war we've ever been in. And if you think this is a movie, you're going to sit back, eat your popcorn, and you're not even going to work on yourself. And if you don't work on yourself, guess what? We're going to go into the Great Reset, the New World Order. We're not going to be going into the Great Awakening. It's all up to you. You have to make that choice. You have to work on yourself. Okay? That's what he's saying here. All these off-worlder sites, these scriptures that talk about this time, say the probability. Um, the Cassiopeians don't even call it prophecy. They call it probability. The probability is that we're going to go positive, but it's just a probability that can change. It can always be hijacked. And the, the choice of whether we go into the negative or positive depends on you. It doesn't depend on Mr. T. It doesn't depend on the Kennedys. It doesn't depend on the White Hats. It depends on you. You make that choice. And you make that choice by actually actively working on yourself. Do your shadow work. Heal yourself. Figure out what is holding you down. What is the lead within your body that's keeping you from not rising in vibration? Once you could do that shadow work and you find that lead, you can alchemize it to gold. That's what the storm is. When Mr. T said the storm is upon us, he didn't mean the white hats. He meant you. You are the storm. That's how powerful you are. Okay. Finally, the seventh person in our group is centered in the crown chakra, which is located at the top of the head. 
For this person, the world is seen as a play of Maya or illusion. Maya is the Sanskrit word for illusion. Though in the world, he or she is detached from it. He or she senses the world in a way that is very difficult to imagine, for consciousness has become aware of itself. The mirror of awareness has been directed inward, and the yogi has seen the self, the one great being living and expressing through the innumerable forms. Exactly. We talked, this is totally spoken about in the Yoga Sutras. While such a person may have the compassion for suffering of others, he or she is not caught up in them. This person sees the world much like a shadow play, no longer affected by the dramas of life. He or she has become aware of the puppeteer and the light that casts the shadows. What was taken as reality is no longer perceived this way. The yogi has attained enlightenment. Yes, again, that's another reason why you need to be doing the work. Because the more that stuff comes up in your life, the less affected by it you are. The more you can observe the suffering for just that and be able to, to almost unrecognize that you're not attached to it. This bondage that you have is actually yourself. It's not coming from anything else but you. In reality, the situation is much more complex than this, since rarely are the chakras balanced in their order. Exactly. Thus, it is possible for a person to have one or more chakras highly activated while residing in another term of psychological motivations. Many an unsuspecting disciple of a spiritual master has been disillusioned by this phenomenon. One is drawn by the obvious spiritual powers and perhaps psychic abilities of a teacher only to find that he or she is power hungry and manipulative or he or she might be promiscuous and not honoring of sexual boundaries. The conflict for a student caught in the unwanted sexual advantage of a spiritual teacher can be psychologically quite difficult. The problem is that the attainment of spiritual powers is not necessarily connected with psychological maturity, which we spoke about last week. Why in many yoga disciplines, including my own of traditional lineage, the siddhis are only talked about after about 10 years worth of practice, and they're to be taken very, very, very seriously. The problem is that attainment of spiritual powers is not necessarily connected to psychological maturity. Just because a yogi has attained these high states of samadhi and bliss does not mean that they have addressed their psychological issues. Exactly. That's what I was just saying. So it means that you're stuck in delusion. So you got to work on yourself. You got to psychologically work on yourself. Talk therapy is great too. Talk therapy helps with that as well. You got to work on your own shit. You can't ignore it. You can't just sit around and play with your tarot cards or your pendulum all day. You got to work on yourself. Thus, someone who has unresolved issues in the lower three centers may misuse their spiritual powers. You might, for instance, have a person who is a great teacher, but has not resolved his or her inherent psychological hostility. God help the student of such a teacher. Or you might encounter someone with extremely developed psychic abilities with an unresolved need to manipulate others. Such a person might show all the signs of spirituality, but he or she will subtly and perhaps not so subtly use his or her psychic powers to sway you. Yes, there are infiltrators on YouTube who are abusing divination tools to spell cast you and sway you. Boom. There you go. In many of these cases, the person is unconscious of his or own psychological motivations, but just because something is unconscious does not mean it cannot do harm. In point of fact, our unconscious motivations often do more harm than those of which we are conscious. This is one reason I believe that the persons undertaking the pathway of alchemy need to become cognitive of their own psychological history and motivations. He's telling you to do the work, right? Do the work. Do the work. Let me read that sentence again. This is one reason I believe that persons undertaking the path of alchemy need to become cognizant of their own psychological histories and motivations. So our whole reality, our whole perception of reality is what makes us be who we are. It's what shapes our character. It what, it's how we react to certain things. For example, I know I know that I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder, CPTSD. I've been diagnosed with it. I've gone through trauma therapy for it. I know what it is. I know how to catch it. And I know how to work through it because I know I have this and I will probably deal with it for the rest of my life. I now understand how it affects my way of behavior. For example, it can cause me to have what is called catastrophe thinking. Okay. Where I all of a sudden jump to the worst case scenario 
on a certain, about a certain thing. And usually it's stupid. Usually it's something that's not that crazy, but I will jump to catastrophe th thinking because this is a trauma I deal with. That is what I have the propensity to do. I also know that I struggle with, because of it, I struggle with high anxiety. This can affect other people in my lives. My, when my CPTSD acts up and the catastrophe thinking comes on and my anxiety comes on, it can cause my behavior to change, which, which affects other people. Yeah. For example, part of my CPTSD is the fact that I'm a little, I struggle with OCD, um, which OCD is not what a lot of people think it is. For example, for example, I get OCD with laundry and this is going to sound very strange, but when I do laundry, I have it in my brain that the first clothes that I put back into the laundry basket, the dirty hamper have to be sweaty exercise clothes. I don't know why my brain does that, but it is a form of OCD. And so I have to be aware of that. And that type of OCD has actually affected some of my relationships in the past, not in a bad way, not in a way that we broke up or anything, but a lot of boyfriends I've had in the past, especially those that I've lived with, it has caused some issues. Um, I am very OCD about the bathroom. The towels have to be hung or folded in a particular way. Okay. That has affected things in the past, but I know what that is. I know that's a side effect of CPTSD. And so once I recognize that, I then can control it. I can sit down, breathe, ask myself, why, why do I need to do this? What am I trying to control um, that I feel like where I feel like I'm out of control in my life? Like that. So when people try to control something that's so silly, that's so silly, like laundry or bathroom towels, I mean, that's so silly. But when I feel like I have that, that, that intensity comes up, that means that there's something within me that I feel is out of control. Okay. And so I have to sit down when that, that comes up, I have to sit down and work through that myself. All right. So all of these behavior patterns that we have is your body's way. Your body is your GPS system. It's your body's way of showing you where something is imbalanced. So again, when my OCD pops up, when my anxiety pops up, when the catastrophe thinking pops up, that's when I know, uh, whoa, I need to sit down. I need a journal. I need to like breathe into this. I need to start asking myself the hard questions. And if something gets really out of hand, I will then call my therapist that I haven't been to in a while. It's actually been a really long time since I've been, into, been in therapy. But if something gets out of hand, I will call her and just have like a conversation with her over the phone for about an hour just to kind of get myself back down into myself. Does that make sense? I am hoping that makes sense. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about Shechem, which is also called life force in uh, yoga. We call this prana. Um, it's also chi, like in Tai Chi, I can also be chi. Also, I just turned the air conditioning on because it's very hot. So I apologize if you can hear that in the background. As I mentioned earlier, the raising of the jed and the activation of the chakras takes tremendous energy. The energy that propels itself up the jed is nothing less than one's own life force called shakem, or literally the power to make things erect. Shakem is the hidden meaning behind the obelisk. Obelisks are freestanding kinds of pillars, except that they don't support anything, and they are pointed up at the tip. They were erected all over Egypt, usually in honor of an important personage. However, they are essentially movements of vital power or shakim. One of the primary tasks of the alchemist within the Egyptian system is to raise his or her excess life form or shakim up the jed. The net result of moving shakim up the jed is that the seals or ch chakras become activated and strengthened. As each chakra is stimulated, latent areas of consciousness and awareness are opened. It is important to understand that the shakim is intimately related to both one's life force and one's sexuality. This power can be used to create a new being as through the act of sex, or it can be used to create higher states of consciousness as through the act of raising the jed. The primary power to accomplish both of these feats is the same. It's simply a matter of what is done with the energy that determines what is accomplished. To put this in its most simplistic terms, a major source of spiritual illumination within the Egyptian system of alchemy is transmuted sexuality. So let's talk about the obelisk for a little bit. So the controllers have definitely manipulated the obelisk. The obelisk in its original 
its original inception is a very, very powerful, positively aspected thing. But once again, as I say in every single episode, the darkness cannot create anything. It can only take from the light and trans or it can only take from the light and invert it. Just as we take our own lead and transmute it to gold, they take from the light and they invert it to darkness. Um, Stephanie brought up once, which I thought this was brilliant. Even church steeples took the idea of the opalisk and captured it to make it their steeple, saying, now, now we as a church control your life force through your own fear. We're going to scare the shit out of you. We're going to make you think if you don't do X, Y, and Z as we tell you to, then you're going to spend eternity in hell. That's just a big fat lie to get you afraid so that they can feed off of your loosh and keep you let it down. They even have the steeple to hold to tell you that they're harnessing your own Christ consciousness from you. Okay. But there's, you have the power to transmute that though, right? They can only mess with your mind. You can't mess with your heart. As I said earlier, they can only mess with your mind, not your heart. So you have the power to walk away and go, no, no, no. I see your games. I see who you work for. You work for Satan. I'm going to walk away and I'm going to harness my own energy because that is what Yahshua taught us. Okay, so please know that the obelisk, I'm so, so, so sick. It's another thing I'm totally sick of. I'm so sick of people saying we can't look at pyramids or we can't look at this or that because that's their stuff. It's not their stuff. It's not their stuff. It's ours. All these things were of the light. They stole it from us and inverted it. All right, so we're taking it back. We're taking it back. It's ours. All right, so we need to be smart about this. We need to understand what these things actually are. All right. The Uraeus. When the energy of Shakam, our transmuted life force, pours into the head through the rising of the jet, there is a tremendous stimulation of the higher brain centers. The activation of these centers eventually generates what is called Uraeus. In sacred Egyptian art, off, one often sees important personages with the snake coming out of their foreheads. This serpent symbolically signifies that the person has attained the Uraeus or has the authority granted by the Uraeus. It often appears to be the headdress of gods and goddesses as well as royalty. I suspect that the artistic use of the Reyes eventually degenerated into a stylistic statement and the original spiritual intent was lost. However, its primary symbolic meaning is that of having attained or activating or anointing of the higher brain cells. What do you think baptism is? It's not being dunked in water, it's not something external, it's internal. This implied that such a person could see beyond the duality of the world, symbolized by another serpent, that of Apollos. Unlike the serpent of Uranus, which is related to enlightenment, Apollos represents the sine wave of all form, dualistic play of opposite forces and creation. This gift of the Uranus is a type of psychic vision, clairvoyance, that allows one to see through the veils of illusion, the play of dualistic oppositions. And I've spoken about this before. This is what, so the dualistic oppositions create the friction. Okay, and we talk about this a lot in traditional yoga, uh, this idea of opposing forces. So you see this playing out in the very primary levels of yoga. You see this playing out in the asana practice, the posture practice, where one posture, one side of the body is generating heat and strengthening while the other one is opening and then it switches off. And so you have this constant pulling of opposing forces in opposite directions. Well, this metaphorically is how we are as human beings. As a human being, we are opposing forces, right? We're in a mortal body. We're an immortal being. Our soul is eternal. It's immortal. It's always existed and it always will exist playing out life in a mortal body. That is probably the biggest cause of friction that there is in the world, right? This understanding of this. So that's what he's talking about here. Now, again, we need friction. We have to have that dualistic life. Third density planets are known as being dualistic. We're in a third density planet. This great awakening is us. We will be going to fourth density. That is 100% certain that we are moving into fourth density. However, once you get to fourth density, you're either going positive or negative. That is not totally certain yet, whether we're going positive or negative. Probability is positive, but as I just said, that depends on you. That depends on you. Not the Kennedys, not Mr. T, not the White Hats, you. Depends on you, okay? 
So we need that friction, right? We need the friction of third density in order to understand and see past the illusion of the dualism. I mean, one of the primary purposes of yoga is to learn to see the truth through the illusion. It's one of the primary purposes. And so once you've done the work, once you've acknowledged the friction, and a lot of that comes from your own shadow work because the macro and the micro, the macro is the controllers that we're seeing in the world. That is only mirroring the micro inside of you, your own darkness, your own shadow work versus your own light so that you can work through it, create the friction. Just like when you're lighting a match, you can't just go light up here and the light appears, right? You have to actually strike the match, create the friction in order for that light to appear. Okay. So this being born into a third density world where there's such a polarity, there's such opposing forces is one of the biggest gifts that source creator has given you because you can use that friction to transmute the lead into gold, to arise, to awaken the Christ consciousness. That is called Kundalini. Kundalini is another thing that the controllers have stolen from us. Kundalini is Christ consciousness that runs up Shashuna, up the pathway of the spine into the upper realms of consciousness. It starts though, it starts, it starts in the pelvic base though. So right here's my hip bones right here, right there in this pelvic floor that I have that you have, move my camera. So this pelvic floor right here, that's where your kundalini lies. It's a, and it is represented by a snake that's curled up. And, and you guys know, for those of us in the deep south, when it's super hot, you start to move, right? You, you throw the sheets off of you in the bed. You've got the fan on the air conditioning. You start to move. That's what happens to kundalini. When you start to get into the friction of your own opposing forces, that kundalini starts to move and awaken. And then it starts to travel up the spine. So... So if you're not working on your lower base self, you're only focused on this. That's why you're going to be into, come into a place of delusion where you're, where you're basically going crazy because that Kundalini starts in your pelvic floor, right by Mulabunda, or right by Muladhara and the Bunda there, the lock there is called Mulabunda. Okay. That's why it's so, so, so important. And yes, they stole the snake from us too. Because you know what? You know who made snakes? Source creator made snakes. You know who made owls? Source creator. You know who made goats? Source creator. And they have stolen that and used that for their own because they know the power. They know the power that the representation that the serpent has for the Christ consciousness. They know what that is. They know more than we do. Trust me on that for sure. They know all of this. And so they stole it to invert it so that we wouldn't figure it out right? So that we would remain enslaved within our own self to their system. Yeah. So please, please, please do your research into this and don't be so dismissive of things just because they've used it. No, they've used it, but it was originally ours. We're taking it back. Okay. Activation of the Uraeus brings with it a whole host of non-ordinary awarenesses and abilities. From my own personal research, I believe that for one, it increases creativity and intelligence. For another, it stimulates some of the powers of consciousness or siddhis I mentioned earlier. Once again, the changes created by alchemy can be tracked to the changes of brain function. As yet, there are no studies on the specific brain changes created by the Uraeus phenomenon, but I suspect based on personal observation, that they involve changes in neurotransmitters and increases in endorphin levels. Since the Uraeus is a sense in, all right, I like that he brought up endorphin levels because um, let's talk about that in the yoga practice. You need to be constantly moving on your mat. You don't need to be in a yoga practice and just like skip in postures or just like hanging out and down dog for longer than the teacher tells you to. You need to keep moving. This creates what we call tapas. Tapas, I'm not talking about the appetizer. This is the Sanskrit word tapas, which means heat and focus. The endorphins play a part of that. In the primary series, which is called Yoga Chikitsa, in the primary series of uh Ashtanga yoga, it's only primary because it is physical therapy. That's what yoga chikitsa means, physical therapy. The middle part of the primary series are a bunch of advanced postures. Okay. Bhujapidasana, 
Kormasana, Supta Kormasana, Garbha Pindasana, Kukutasana. These are all highly advanced postures. Supta Kormasana, you got both your legs behind your head already. Okay. And this is in the primary series. So this is why it takes like five years at least to really work through primary series. But before you get to this middle part of the primary series, you're building up to this. Your body's moving. You're doing one jump back after the other jump back after the other jump back. You've engaged your bundas. So by the time you get to that middle part, not only are you hot and sweaty and opened, but your endorphins are pumping and your mind is focused. The only way you break focus is by stopping the practice, resting, going to the bathroom, taking a sip of water. Do not drink water while you're exercising. Drink it after you're exercising. The water is cooling down your tapas. It's cooling down your focus. It's cooling down that active meditation. Okay. Those are that endorphin levels that, he, that he's talking about are super, super, super important. All right. Since the uraeus is uh, sensed in a dreamlike state of awareness, I also suspect increases in alpha and or theta activity. Finally, I believe that there is a radical increase in non-dominant hemispheric functioning in those who experience this phenomenon. My reason for this is that in my own experiments with precursors to Uranus, my sense of space became highly altered and there was a cessation of internal dialogue, which would indicate a decrease of activity within the dominant or talking hemisphere. It is not in the scope of this introduction to discuss that many interesting points regarding the alchemy and brain physiology, but I will say this, the practices of internal alchemy, such as the Egyptian stream, create definite changes in the brain function, which in turn directly affect perception. Whole point of yoga, right? The yoga sutras. The yoga sutras, all they're talking about is yoga chitta vritti narodaha. Yoga chitta vritti narodaha. That's going to be everybody's mantra. Yoga chitta vritti narodaha. Yoga is, is taking the, chit the chittam, the brain stuff, is what chittam means, it's the brain stuff, so thoughts, and vrittis are, the, are like the waves, the, the thought waves, right? So the, the waves that come out of the chittam. That's the yoga, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Nirodaha means nothingness. So getting rid of our thoughts that create bondage. Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, the mind stuff. It's dealing with the mind stuff. So he's right. By masterfully controlling these brain states through meditative practices, the alchemist is able to enter non-ordinary realms of awareness. And it is through these unusual states of inner attention that the practitioner is able to affect the quantum reality, the Ka body, and the Uraeus. All right, guys, I'm going to leave it there for today. I think that's a good starting point um, for you to start to look into the chakra system. Once again, I am going to be placing that book. Uh, Eastern, let's Eastern body, Western mind down in the description box below for anybody who's interested in do, starting to do their own work into their chakra system. As always, I would very much suggest you find a teacher to help you as well. Sometimes when we're on these spiritual paths, we have these blind spots in our own shadow work, which can actually cause the ego to get even bigger. We need somebody to help keep us. Your teacher should not be your friend, right? Your teacher should be someone that holds you accountable, holds your feet to the fire. They should not be reading you poetry. They should not be giving you rubs on your shoulders. Your teacher needs to be someone that keeps you accountable, gives you tough love. So that's what kind of a teacher you need to break through this trap of the ego. So I hope you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.